And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Star City Savages, creator of the upcoming Savage Worlds campaign setting The Drowned War, the one and only Dustin Allen Smith, the Das Man. How you doing today, man? Oh, oh, all is well. <laughs> uh, I'm doing pretty good, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank, thank you for thank you for coming on, and thank you for putting up with time zone chicanery. No, oh, it's it's all good. Like pretty much everybody that I've had to deal with, it's been like at least one to four hours difference. So. Uh, apparently, you're having more fun that further out. Um, for what? God help you if you have if you have to deal with time zone management across the pond. Oh my gosh! Well, actually, yeah, there are some people in the Savage Worlds community that uh, that they live in England, and mm -hmm. some of like Star City Savages are are overseas, and it's been interesting because they've they've had like games at like two and three in the morning, and they're like, "Oh, I'm so glad." So glad we have like this group. <laughs> yeah. Um I've had, I um out of out of sheer out of sheer pettiness I ended up set I ended up setting up a I ended up getting a dozen or so on clocks and just set them to different time zones, you know, how you how you might see them in say a, say a large office or or in a newsroom. Yeah, that that actually sounds like a cool aesthetic, man. I I'd, I'd be down for something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like either it's like the different clocks with the time zones or dogs playing poker. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now, gr granted, I have a certain app that I use to li to line up time zones to make it easier when scheduling, but that's a whole that's a whole other um, can of fish. Um, that's all. It's all good, man. Better living through technology. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's a tradition to open with the humble beginnings at, in in a sense. And mm -hmm. with that, with that in mind, I'd like to, I'd like to have you walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Well, there, uh, it goes way back uh, because my first introduction and what made it stick are decades apart. Mm -hmm. All right, so I was born in 1980, and so I am a child of the 80s. So I remember sort of the media equivalent, like the cartoon Dungeons and Dragons and people actually playing Dungeons and Dragons. But back then, we were we were going through the satanic panic, so no one actually admitted to playing Dungeons and Dragons. And technology hadn't advanced to the point where you could meet people online and play with them. Mm -hmm. So I actually was in... Uh, I was in school, and the school that I was going to at the time had, like, one of the first internet connections. And so I would end up going online to try and get into a D&D &D campaign. And since the internet was so slow, I would be able to take one turn and find out how I died the next day. So that all went on for a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, the area that I grew up in was very, like, rural, middle of nowhere. I mean, you know, we had to truck in sunlight twice a week. Oh, yeah, I know I know that feeling. <laughs> so I would eventually, like, there's a city, like, pretty close, like a real city. And when my family would go there, I'd want to check out the comic book shops. And I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of times, like, your riff your riffs dimension books or world books would end up secondhand in the comic shops and like the lower boxes. Mm -hmm. So I pick up some of them thinking that they were like short stories or sci-fi because that's how riffs and palladium would set it up. They would set up their books, not like a technical manual, but almost like they were telling you stories and then you'd get like nine or 10 stat pages. So those were my first experiences with role playing, and I didn't have a group or I didn't have anybody to play with, and it was just it was pretty much just me sort of milling around. 
And stick a pin in that and flash forward uh, into the 2000s. I actually move forward. I, I get to college. I play a little bit of D&D um, with some people that weren't even in my college. I was just like hanging out and randomly like showing up for games. And then after college, I actually find a group of people here in Roanoke. And they're playing Savage Worlds. So what got my ability to roleplay to stick was actually coming here and developing like good solid friends who were playing and, and the guy that was like our first GM, like I told him I wanted to run a I wanted to be in a Fallout game. So we're we're playing Fallout 3, and he doesn't know Savage Worlds, but he knew just enough of Savage Worlds to sort of, like, make it playable. But I was hooked, man. So I go on Amazon, and I get the Savage Worlds Deluxe, and then I go back, and I see that they've got Deadlands Noir. Mm -hmm. I buy Deadlands Noir. Shout out to John Goff. That book is amazing. Um, And I... I go online, I find Roll20, like I start searching through and I find the internet has resources for people that actually like to play, that actually make the connection. So I join a Skype group, um, I start playing with that group, and then we had, a, we had a game master who he would take on way more than he should have. And he was a great storyteller, but what would happen is that he would... He would sign up for all of these games, and then he'd have to cancel because his life was so busy. So what I started doing was, whenever he would cancel a game, I would pick up the time slot and run a one-shot because all the people were there, and they wanted to play. And this kind of led to when the group fell apart, because, you know, all the time groups fall apart, the, the people were like, well, hey... uh." We still want to play. And I'm like, well, I could start a group. I did. And from there, uh, I I took and I sort of built up this community of the people that were from there and sort of invited more people. Uh, yeah, no, it's that's how it's stuck. Mm -hmm. And to you, okay. what... What um what about Savage Worlds stood out to you? So Savage Worlds is it's got just enough crunch. So like here's the deal if you're if you're playing something like Fourth Edition or Pathfinder, a lot of what works with that is, it's been my experience working with playing in games with people is that everything is focused around character building. And I've sat down and there were guys that would have that laser focus in character building and they would create this unstoppable character just because they knew how to build it right. Savage Worlds has enough swing so that it's structured. There's a very strong, very stable framework. But at the same time, it has its aces or its explosions. It has a critical fails. It has enough swing, and it's loose and abstract enough that you can really play a more narrative game. So a lot of what I do is, is I'm more of a role player. I'm a thespian, as it were, when it comes to my games. And there have been a lot of situations where I would be a player... And the game master would actually start fudging in my favor just because he wanted to see where I was going. Like, I, there are points where I could talk bad guys into just letting us into their camp because I was role playing that character. Mm -hmm. So, but if if you are working with just a build, like I would have this situation where that same character, even though I as a player was role playing it well. If I'd have built it, I, it was terrible how I built it. Like, if they were doing rules as written, my guy would have just died tripping over a rock or something. On one hand, I can certainly see that. On the other hand, as my mentor once said, 
Some games have some games have more traps than a than a whorehouse in Thailand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it's something it's something that I've never I've never been a fan of. It's um, it's one of it's one of those it's one of those things that um, some people have the system mastery school of thought will um will at will always advocate for, but mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just one step away from elitism. And yeah. In some in some cases, it's just it's just simple cases of a des a designer not a designer not thinking things through because of the sample size of their testers. You know. Right. Hand, it's important to apply Hanlon's razor if you're familiar with that concept. I am. Yeah. Um. But with that with that in mind, how did the drowned war um get set up? Was it a given? You mentioned Fallout. Was it a case of a um, was it a case of a fallout like idea that you guys j that just um spiraled into something else or did it have a different path it actually was related to travel uh travel and a desire to play in multiple genres mm -hmm. so um this is how it started and in my mind a lot of things get all mixed up like it's it's kind of like when i'm doing something over here like the paint will run into it and I'll be like, no, no, get back over there. And it, it kind of like creates cross thinking. Mm -hmm. So I was talking with another GM and he, uh, he told me that like his biggest problem was travel is like, how do you prevent in a lot of games? It would make sense to just leave. Like, why are they still there pursuing the adventure? I said that the reason why fantasy is so popular is because, you know, you have to walk or ride a horse, but once you get to modern, you can just get in a car and leave the situation. So it doesn't make sense why the players are there. So I kind of worked off of that, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of sci-fi and fantasy and horror, and so there's this author, his name's J.D. Ballard, and Ballard wrote... A book called *The Drowned World*. Now, *The Drowned World* and *The Drowned War* are different because in *The Drowned World*, they flood because a comet melts the polar ice caps. In this one, it's it's not that. It's something different. There's mutations in cyberware. They don't get into any of that. It's it's very different. Mm -hmm. But the concept of the world flooding is in both. So I was thinking that one of the if we could. You can't drive on water. I mean, you can boat, but you're still kind of in the same sort of problem. I mean, you can't use a boat in the same way you can use a car. You can't just take the roads. You have to calculate fuel and, and so on and so forth. So I started working with that. And then my desire to sort of have so many different genres, I thought, well, if I if I take these like man-made islands like these giant flotillas i can encapsulate them in their own sort of genre setting and then i can cross-pollinate the different genres so i can have a hard-boiled detective working with a superhero working with a fantasy druid in the post-apocalypse so all of that just got thrown in the blender. And then from there, I started picking it out and building the lore around it. So I had to go back. And after I created this gigantic world with, you know, Lovecraftian horror on one flotilla and like different superhero teams on another, I started putting it all into the book. And then. I take it to my playtesters and I take it to my, my groups and they're like, it's too big. I said, you have to narrow your focus. So that's what I did. I, I took the lens from way out and all these just gigantic sort of worlds and I narrowed it in on Refuse, which is the post-apocalyptic sort of junk setting. Mm -hmm. So Refuse is a combination of sort of the post-apocalypse, but also a lot of Western tropes. Because uh, Westerns deal with the frontier and lawlessness. And 
the post-apocalypse also deals with a new frontier, like the collapse of society. So you can't, yeah, you have these pockets of civilization, and then you have this sort of grander, like, savage world right outside. So that's the struggle in Westerns, is between man versus nature, mm -hmm. civilization versus brutality. And a lot of your Western tropes deal with the people who are civilized having to embrace and cultivate and then domesticate their own savagery in order to combat the the dangerous world that they live in. And that's the same idea with the post-apocalyptic stories. Like, there is something horrible out there, but you have to find what's tough and dangerous within you to face it. So. Which makes, which certainly makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, with, the, now, with that kind of thing in mind, with that kind of thing in mind, um, given the, with the, given the fact that you're deal with, that you're dealing with humanity on these mega cities, um, mm -hmm. Obviously, when I hear the term Mega City, I immediately think of Mega City One from um, 2000 AD. But right. how how big how big is a, a me is a Mega City compared to a contemporary city? How, how so, big is one of the flotillas? So the flotillas are the size of a state. Uh, Flotilla Oceania, you can think of as Massachusetts. And Flotilla Pacifica, you can think of, or actually, Flotilla Oceania, you can think of as Boston, and Flotilla Pacifica, you can think of as L.A. Mm -hmm. And then you can think of how much farmland it would take to support them and tack that on. So they are pretty big. Like, if you were to actually calculate how many people live in Los Angeles, um, and then double the landmass that's the kind of the idea that you would get so the so within these flotillas are there large amounts of land masses dedicated just to um to creating the means to support to support that um floating city yes they're called garden districts mm -hmm. and you have a lot of gmo and then some of them have garden districts and some of them don't because your more science fiction oriented flotillas like Flotilla Daedalus and Flotilla Labori, mm -hmm. they utilize vertical gardening. So they actually have skyscrapers that are vertical gardens. But um, flotillas like Pacifica and Oceania, which are your two biggest, they have a lot of farmland. Now I'm going to tell you, it's not really talked about, but they actually do have vertical gardens in both of those to compensate, mm -hmm. but they're not they're not public knowledge. Like, there's a lot of things that, like, the flotilla governments hide from the people that live there. Which I, I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. Now, mm -hmm. when, now, um, when I ended up go, when, now, one of the, one of the elements that I ended up, I ended up finding out when I was delving into it is, for starters, you you've mentioned that you're taking in elements of Lovecraft of Lovecraftian horror. Um, yes. And obviously, obviously, nobody's going to be going into this thing expecting da expecting Dagon or ex or expecting um and any of the any of the elder gods. But how do, how does how does that particular brand of horror represent itself within the uh, within the flotillas and out of them? All right. So. The main focus of the book is on the junk flotilla of refuse, which is the post-apocalyptic setting. Mm -hmm. And outside of your sanctioned flotillas, which are your mega cities, you have um, the situation where you just have people that are kind of people that are able to disappear. If you catch my drift, mm -hmm. the overarching bad guy of the setting is a group called Seven Helix. Seven Helix started out as the World Navy Science Division, and they found compounds that allowed them to sort of crack the genetic code. So cyberware and spliceware. Spliceware is like body modification that uses genetic augmentation. Mm -hmm. Are major parts of the setting. Seven Helix has spliced themselves so much that they've 
they're not human anymore. They're they're Lovecraftian creatures. Like, um, I I can send you a picture. I don't know if the like viewers can see it, but I can send it to you just so you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, go go ahead. All right. Let me go to the art section here. But um, yeah, they use biotechnology. They use uh, mechanical and biomechanical. That's one of the seven Helix soldiers right there. Yeah, I can I can see that. I've seen enough tentacles to know where that's going. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. So oh. they've actually like spliced themselves to the point that they don't have human emotions anymore, and they're all kind of on this psychic hive mind. Like seven Helix soldiers are all mind linked. So whenever they're around and talking to one another, you don't hear them speaking, but you kind of feel this buzzing in your ear. It's like there's a ringing. Mm -hmm. um, now, with, now, given the fact that you're dealing with flotillas on, a, on an, what's essentially an ocean planet, you've made, you've made it clear that there's no, that there's no more major land masses on, right. the, on the planet anymore. Um, mm -hmm. what is what would be the impetus for people to try to go out to go outside of the flotilla? So, the the flotillas have their own problems. <laughs> if you're on a sanctioned flotilla, like we'll go with flotilla Oceania, for example, that's where things get really kind of Lovecraftian. The tagline for Flotilla Oceania is, the year is 1934, the year is always 1934. Um, Flotilla Oceania is controlled by a group called the Department of Information, and they dictate that everyone conforms to the aesthetic of the 1930s. Uh, books and alcohol are illegal. Like Prohibition isn't just alcohol there, it's also written material. Now they have like they have advanced technology, but that technology has to conform to sort of the Art Deco nineteen thirties aesthetic. They control all of the information. They have like their own G Men type group that sort of read your mind. So a lot of people that are on Flotilla Oceania that would want to escape want to do so so that they'll escape the authoritarian government. Mm -hmm. uh, Flotilla Pacifica is media controlled but it's superheroes so with Flotilla Pacifica what happened th this is the actual war by the way is that someone attacked Flotilla Pacifica and ruptured their pulmentary or their soup reserves soup is the, the genetic accelerant that causes people to mutate mm -hmm. it it infected a swath of the population and they had to be quarantined. Well, now the quarantines are lifted and you have this group of people that are coming out that have superpowers. So it riffs off of the 1990s sort of X-Men mutants are a different type of citizen. You know, they're not they're not like us. They have weird powers. They're they're different. The whole homo but, sapiens versus homo superior. Correct. Yes. And more than just that, Flotilla Pacifica is controlled by a group called Distant Studios. Distant Studios is media control. And they control the populace by, I don't know if you're familiar with like Michel Foucault, but Foucault proposed the Gazing Society in which someone creates this sort of like granite idol that everybody has to look up to and conform to. Well, Distant Studios uses media presence to create the image of superheroes. And if you have superpowers and you don't conform to this image of a superhero, then you're you're just you're scum. You're not living up to your potential. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, I took the idea of a brave new world and I replaced Soma with media. Um, acceptance with like social media and so on and so forth. So celebrity status. I took Soma and replaced it with celebrity status. So while people might look at 
flotilla Oceania and be like, oh, wow, I don't, I don't want to live there. That's terrible. And they look at flotilla and Pacifica and they're like, okay, well, that's nice. And if you get down into the weeds, it's terrible there. It's like they are, they're programming your mind through algorithms and through data manipulation. Mm-hmm. And you don't even know it because they're giving you a drug. <laughs> Yeah, it is the it is the classic se- the classic setup of a of a dystopia. Yeah, um, but it's a friendly dystopia. Air quotes friendly. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to when when it when it comes to the when it comes to the idea of modification modification, whether whether it be biological or or cybernetic. Um, in some games and in some setups, there's there's usually this risk of the more you modify the 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 um, more distant you are from your own humanity. Um, with a the um, biggest case of this is of course the humanity slash empathy thing that gets dr- that gets drained the more cyberware you put on in say Cyberpunk or the um, essence rules in um, Shadowrun and. While you are using the framework of Savage Worlds, was there ever thought about putting something in there so so that it's more and more clear the more um, augmentations you do, the less um, the less human you feel? Oh yeah, Savage Worlds already had that. Mm-hmm. They had something called the strain mechanic, and with strain, as you take on more augmentations, you start reducing. Uh, Savage Worlds has like a point by system, and one of the attributes is vigor. Mm-hmm. And they have different ways of doing it, but in the Drowned War, it's based around vigor, and you lose points of strain based off of how much augmentation you get. I I tweaked it so it's it's a little bit different, and then I introduced a setting rule called Grim Obsession or abscission. So what happens is is that when you take on these augmentations, in order for your augmentation to actually be implanted, you have to have they have to use soup to make it possible, whether it's spliceware. Um the the doctor you you buy it, like you mechanically buy it but then you have to make a roll to see how you recover from the surgery and if you critically fail you can pick up something called an aberration so aberrations are sort of this other creature that has kind of taken over a part of your body Mm -hmm. so there's a body horror element there like one of the one of the pieces of art i'm i'm having commissioned is like somebody whose face is kind of melted off and there's an eye in his shoulder just looking at you Mm -hmm. one of them is called uh passenger in which you have somebody just chatting in your ear that only you can hear um pika is another one like you have this strange urge to eat things that you're not supposed to eat uh, and then blackout is like the worst one. It's like there's somebody that wants to take over your body, so you have to fight against that. So there are some body horror elements in in actually picking up cyberware, spliceware. So you have to like weigh out: Do I want to risk this versus do I want the ability or the power that comes with it? Now, given that, um. In some systems, I've seen it where, where um, cy- whether whether cyberware is, but whether um, whether where it the where is, um, biological, i.e. spliceware in this case, or um, technological, i.e. cyberware, um, they end they end up uh, they end up accomplishing the same thing. Um, in some cases, the some cases spliceware is more expensive because it's a newer thing, but. What is what are what would be the core advantages and disadvantages to picking one over the other in the drowned war? So if you're going to pick up spliceware, only humans, the human race is the like pure strain human is the only one that can get spliceware. And that's because like if you're all of the races are human. They're all human, 
but they have some kind of modification that has caused them their code to be different. So with a pure strain human picking up spliceware, they can only pick it up at like major milestones. Mm -hmm. So they can gradually become something different over time. I linked cyberware and spliceware into the transhuman edge, which means that you can choose one at a milestone, but you can't load up, like you can't take this constantly. Uh, cyberware is available to everybody because like the the Pulmenti used in that is much lower and it doesn't have to be guided as much. It's just there to sort of move along the process of accepting the artificial equipment as part of your body. Whereas if you're going to do spliceware, it's rewriting parts of your whole code. So you have to use a lot more and it's very dangerous. And that's why only pure strain humans can take it is because uh, the other races have had their codes cracked and rearranged and there's just too many variables. Mm -hmm. The benefit is, is that you can pretty much as a pure strain human, make your own race. Like you can just, whatever you can imagine having, you can pick it and it's yours. Yeah. Now with now, um, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, when, mm -hmm. it, com um, when it comes to, when it, when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the when it came to th things like the currency and the economy of the um, of the flotilla no known as refuse, right? Um, the fir the first thing is when it is when it comes to scrap. Would would it be fair of me to say that a Fallout player would be right at home um, comparing scrap to bottle caps? I think you could do that because we we pretty much said that if you wanted to use cogs or flywheels as a currency, you could do that. Mm -hmm. But scrap is sort of like they use scrap to build their houses, to build their equipment, to repair things. So people have to go underwater to find things to pull up or they have to go into like dangerous parts of the cities and knock stuff off buildings and take it back. So it's out there, but it takes work to get it. You could do that. Another, like the fiat currency is favors. So if you wanted to sort of like barter for uh, one service, you could do another service. It's kind of like how people in collapsed societies have to argue over the value of goods traded back and forth. Like, they don't have a representative currency. And so for a lot of people, that's really hard to get around. That's why we were like, if you really need to, just refer to dollars as cogs and flywheels. Mm -hmm. But yeah, even even Fallout does it, because uh, what's the difference between a bottle cap and a dollar? Oh, what one is one is treated like absolute trash, as you can, as could be seen when you try, whenever you try and sell um, pre-war bills at at any shop. <laughs> right. Yeah. So to us, like to us, currency is valuable, but we have to consider the fact that currency is just a promissory note backed by the government. Mm -hmm. And on um, on refuse. Scrap is backed by the need for building materials. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing, the other thing that I that I was curious about is the idea of it ha of it having a debt driven economy. Right. Um, I'd like you to go into what what you meant by that and how that pl how that plays out on refuse. So they have a, a little section of the flotilla. Uh, called Debtor's Corner. And Debtor's Corner is where they keep the ledgers. The ledgers hold a record of who owes what. You can never really get ahead on refuse mm -hmm. because you're that one of the mechanics is you're always like four days out from starving or four days out from dehydrating because like clean water is harder to come by. Mm -hmm. But they keep a record of what people owe in debtor's corner 
And you have to keep paying it because if you go way into debt and you can't pay it, you've committed a crime. They can actually take you and put you into servitude to pay off the debt. I, uh, I patterned it after ancient Rome, how um, in ancient Rome they could just – like people could say, well, hey, you owe this amount of money in taxes. You haven't paid it. You know, you work for this guy now. Oh, is it is it a in some stories we see that we see the notion of that debt constantly being um being added and a added and added to keep someone trapped is that something that could potentially happen with this debt economy yes there is actually a hindrance called indentured and indentured is where your debt has gotten to the point where you are actually a servant to someone else mm -hmm. and if you get a big windfall like if you hit a massive payday the person you're a servant to can actually just claim it as their own. And if they commit a crime and they have to pay for that crime, they can just offer you up in their place. Needless to say, it's a major hindrance. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but that's that's how it worked in like ancient Rome. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. Now... When it com when it comes to the when it comes to the la the um layout of layout of the place of of the of the city of refuse do you pl do you plan on having a bit of a overall map that go that shows that that shows the different major locations or districts or what or which have you eventually I want to I really do because I think refuse is such a an interesting place uh, I'll go ahead and share it with you I got uh emmanuel uh, martinez lima i got him to actually i commissioned him to draw refuse and i'll share with you what it looks like so that's refuse mm -hmm. it's four aircraft carriers and um there are favelas on top of the aircraft carriers so we've got like stories of people on top of stories of people on top of these weapons of war like an aircraft carrier is already its own miniature city, so I thought he did a great job. Eventually, I do want to go back and have maps of refuse made of particular locations like the temple, like their coliseum, like the 24-7 market. I want to go back and have some of these places made, but... The actual area itself is, as you can see, pretty big. I think I couldn't fit one single... I couldn't fit it all in one single map. Mm -hmm. But yeah, eventually I do. I've been... It, I, I've released a couple of one-shots for it, and most of my one-shots, I actually do include maps that, that I put together for uh, for the adventures. Let's see. Yeah. And when it came, when it, with that in, with that in mind, um, now give, given the fact that, um, that, that, as I understand it, a major pillar is going, it is going beneath the surface to, to, um, do salvage operations. Um, one of the, one of the big things that, that I'd have, that I'd have to ask is, I'm I'm not sure if this was a direct influence, but are you at all familiar with the game um, Sunless Sea? I am not. No. Right. Um. I get the I get the feeling I'm not the only person who who um who brought that up. I'll just chalk that up to a happy coincidence. <laughs> but that does bring me to ship use. Um, mm hmm. Is trying to do ship use and and inevitably ship combat is a tricky enough affair when you're dealing with ships on the surface. Um, how do you t how do you tackle that when you're dealing with ships below the surface? When you when you're dealing with su with submarines or slum or submarine slides or their equivalents. So in terms of underwater combat. You are in this situation where you're you're really doing range fighting. 
Um, the same rules that would apply to regular ship-based combat would apply there. However, you're going to have to deal with loss of pressure and uh, traumatic damage, so you'd have to close out bulkheads and such. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, really, it just comes down to, like, the the basic vehicle rules of Savage Worlds would fill in there. All right, I got you. Now you mentioned the t you mentioned the temple beforehand, mm -hmm. um, which I believe you're referring to the Temple of Floating Truth. I am. Yes. Um, what can you tell me about about the, about their presence on the flotilla? So, the flotilla refuse is so old, people don't know how old it is, but they are. Um, their main religious organization is a group called the Temple of Floating Truth. Mm -hmm. When the the flotilla was founded, Jack Caldwell and his wife, Bonnie, were the ones that sort of found the naval yard. And she was an engineer, so she started like working to build things together. He was an oceanographer, so they kind of worked. They started collecting survivors and building uh, like the structures of the city. Mm -hmm. Um... A group of five businessmen uh, that were got together and they started sort of creating a salvage crew. And they were like the first salvage crew and they started hiring people. They started to have more influence because they were able to get the scrap that was needed to build the city to like sort of lash things together. So while Jack and Bonnie were the ones that were setting up the city and sort of like working on the framework. Mm -hmm. They were getting the materials to be needed for it. Now, eventually, a civilization will develop, and when a civilization develops, you have things like elections. Well, the five salvage crew leaders won all of five seats on the city council. Jack uh, did not like that, and he protested. But then he, he was found murdered later. So Bonnie uh, assumed that they were the ones that killed him because of that. And she, uh, she founded the Temple of Floating Truth. Now, their, their public face is that we're here to advocate for the refugees and we're here to make sure that people are fed and we're here to sort of foster a community and teach people survival skills and engineering and math and science. But in, internally, they have a sort of belief. They call, the, they call the five leaders of the city council, no matter who they are, they call them the diver lords. Mm -hmm. And they have this belief that they are representations of evil, like that they are five thieves that rob you of enlightenment and that they represent flaws in your personality. Mm -hmm. So the Temple of Floating Truth, on one hand, is actually working. Some of the people that are real, genuine, decent people are working towards achieving enlightenment and sort of helping out society at large. But then you have like this other group within the temple that are pretty much anarchists, that they just want to destroy the infrastructure of the city and make the people that they believe are spiritual evil pay. Mm -hmm. and, and I love it because you have, within that situation, some genuinely good people that give the other people the benefit of the doubt, but then you have people that think that they're good that are falling to their own belief. Like, they're actually being robbed of their own concept of enlightenment by this mission to overthrow the Diver Lords. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it was ages ago, so the men that were in that crew are long since dead. So it's just whoever holds a position on the city council by default gets assigned sort of one of these flaws as being uh, one of the five thieves. Now, with it, Given the given that given that the um as when I was looking at the preview, the other thing that I couldn't help but notice is that the the that there are five um there are five bylaws of the temple, and would it be fair of me to say that five is the kind of 
sacred number for them? I would say, yeah. In a lot of places, five is. Um, let me open it up. The, the concept of it is that it was, when Bonnie was sort of structuring it, it was based around this idea of creating an ability to resist. But then she's also, she really did have some good humanitarian goals outside of her anger. So she really did want to help. So there's this concept of needing to foster a community. But then there's also this concept of wanting to get even with the people that killed her husband. So things like um, everybody has to be armed. If someone comes to the temple and they are not armed, give them a weapon. Like The idea is you cannot defend your faith if you don't have a weapon. So in playtest, that was kind of funny because... You know, some of the people went to the temple and they hid their weapons because they thought that the temple was going to be a bunch of, like, Lovecraftian cultists and it was going to be nuts. And they go in there and they ask, are you armed? And, and the party has all of their knives and guns and all that hidden. And so when they ask, are you armed? And they say, no, we're not armed. They say, oh, well, here, have this knife or here, have this pickaxe. <laughs> so the the party is like laughing hysterically because they're like okay maybe we were armed so they have a good old time they just start trading weapons with like different members of the temple mm -hmm. um yeah they they do have five is a sacred number in that it's based around the five thieves that rob you of enlightenment this idea that if you have these flaws within yourself, they will drain you of what it takes to reach like that next level mentally or spiritually. Mm -hmm. um, so lust, wrath, greed, attachment. And, and attachment is hard for people because they, they're like, you mean like Jedi? And I'm like, well, if you think about it, like attachment is... The fettered mind, it's the idea that you have to win or you have to achieve this. Uh, so if you can get mentally to the place that not winning or not getting this, you're going to be okay, then you can sort of like focus on things outside of that singular goal. Like you have to have a life outside of this one razor pinpoint area. Mm -hmm. Now... With, now, uh, given some of the weapons that you mentioned, would it be fair of me to say that um, even the even the most root even firearms that we would consider rudimentary these days are extremely rare um, in the setting of the Drowned War? Uh, what do you mean? Like the the idea. Th because the when you meant when you mentioned the kind of weapons that might get traded around between um, party members and people of the temple, mm -hmm. it put the it put the concept in my mind that because of space being at a premium and because of um, the how limited resources are, that um, fire that firearms are not as are not as much of a thing. Ah, that's where things get interesting. So. There is a struggle going on on the flotilla between refugees and citizens. Mm -hmm. And a, a refugee has, again, this goes back to ancient Rome, because you could be a citizen of Rome and have rights, and you could not be a citizen of Rome and not have the same kind of rights. So refugees are not allowed to have firearms, own property, and they have to hire an advocate if they're accused of a debt. There's an edge called the citizen edge. And with the citizen edge, you you can own property, you can have and own and carry firearms. Uh, and if you're accused of a debt, an advocate is provided for you. The drawback is you have to pay taxes. And that goes back to the idea of in Rome, that if you wanted citizenship, you had to pay the taxes to maintain the infrastructure. So the city council argues that 
the citizens have these rights because they pay for them with their taxes to maintain the infrastructure, to build up the city, to provide for public works. And the Temple of Floating Truth argues, well, the refugees should also have these rights. But then they sort of whisper, but they shouldn't have to pay the taxes. It's like, you mean to, like, you have to understand that the citizens, we, we, it, it, the city council argue like everybody assumes that the city council is the bad guys, but they're like we still have people. We don't turn people away. We just sort of limit what they can do while they're here. And the people that actually like pay to keep the city going, we we kind of make sure they're okay. But then the temple is like, yeah, but their their labor is being abused, like. They don't have an advocate, so they just get snatched up and sold into slavery. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so there are, like, a lot of plot lines like that that can happen. I would say that, you know, if a game master actually hears this and they're running it, check to see if your player has the citizen edge before any kind of person snatches them up, because an advocate is not somebody that you want to mess with. We're talking about, like, bad people coming just put you into slavery for for trying to grab a citizen mm -hmm. but refugees can't refugees would have to hire an advocate and they can get expensive yeah now within within that i now i given that we, you mentioned you, you mentioned the the council and the um and the temple but what would be so, but given how you're there is a lot of, um, a lot of old, a lot of old school motifs. You know, say, you know, it's all, it's always that one, it's always that one year, no matter what day of the week it is. Um, what would be some of the minor factions within Refuse? Minor factions. Uh, you have groups like the Bilgewater Union. The Bilgewater Union are your dwarfs. Um, they're we don't call them dwarves, we call them unionists. Uh, their mutation is they're suited to work in small, cramped environments and they can see in the dark. So with the Bilgewater Union, it's kind of like the city council says, okay, we have to keep this boat afloat. So you get to be a part of refuse and we'll leave you alone. Just keep the boats afloat. The Bilgewater Union is below deck, so if you're not a unionist, you don't go below deck. They just, they, below the water line is theirs, and they kind of have this clan system, like family structures that they sort of, like, work around. When I write the fiction, they all sound Scottish, because, well, you know. Dwarves. Dwarves. Yeah, I actually, I wrote a book, um, it's on Kindle right now, and one of the characters is a unionist. Uh, who got banished from below below sea level, and uh, he definitely has a Scottish accent when I write him and when I hear him in my head. Yeah, it's um for me for me I can, for me I I keep I keep seeing um I keep seeing dwarves as Scottish ever ever since um the infamous war the infamous Warhammer's quest um dub. Invo involving the longest period, the longest amount of dwarven diplomacy, i.e., insulting the elf that one would ever see. You know, finding new ways to insult an elf for about a minute and ten seconds. Right. <laughs> well, that goes back to Tolkien, man. Like you have that whole like Legolas and Gimli, how they just completely go at each other, but then they become buddies. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And uh, I got to say, Jonathan Rhys, he, he did such a great job, but ever since the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, like, the Scottish accent completely stuck in my head. Yeah. Now, when it, com now, when it comes to adapting this particular setting into um, Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, or as it's been unfortunately nicknamed since, Swade, mm -hmm. um... What were some what were some of the things that that um that required a bit more legwork to adapt into uh, to adapt into Suede, or was it mostly smooth sailing? There was some adaption uh, because as a licensee, 
I have to be mindful of what I am using from Savage Worlds. Mm -hmm. Like, I cannot, I can't just reprint their work. I have to sort of refer back to it. I can reference it somewhat, but I can't, I can't verbatim just quote it. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been kind of an issue to like be mindful of that. And I've, I've really tried to be respectful. There were times where my editor has come back and says, you know, you can put this in here. Like, this is okay to put in here as long as you don't go too far. I'm like, okay. Um, in Deluxe and Adventure Edition, they had companions. They had the sci-fi companion, the horror companion, the fantasy companion. With Adventure Edition, the new companions haven't come out yet. So I've been resident to reference later edition or other editions. Instead, I've gone back and done my best to adapt installing cyberware to my understanding of how the rules would work. So I based a lot of cyberware around the concept of creating race. Mm -hmm. And then I divided up like the different pathways. So there are in cyberware there are three pathways and one is based around uh, arcane backgrounds one is based around racial abilities and special racial traits and another one is based around installing mundane gear and it was a labor of love to sort of calculate based off of my understanding how to make that all fit in Sort of to calculate things like, all right, if, if I'm going to take a piece of gear, I have to think outside of the box. I have to think in terms of an abstract so that the person can calculate this. And I have to put a limit on it. Like, mm -hmm. there has to be, you can't just install a ship's gun on your arm. You have to sort of say, this piece of equipment is too heavy. And game masters would be like, no, no, this goes beyond the weight limit. Find something smaller and use that. So I, I found this method of taking weight and using the weight to calculate strain, and then this method of explaining what it does and saying that if you apply modifiers, then it will increase the strain. So you can't just become a demigod. You can't become all-powerful right out of the gate. You have to work for it over time, and as you're spending more gaining more uh, modifications, you're losing more and more of yourself, and you're risking those aberrations as you go. Mm -hmm. Because soup isn't just in the surgery, it's in the environment. There's a chance that you can come across uh, like a soup spill in the world, and you can lose points of strain. And if you lose all of your strain, you just become a, a, a creature. You, you mutate. So it's a calculated risk. I didn't want people to just become... Uh, I didn't want people to just immediately spend everything and then their their player just slip and fall into a puddle and, and just they completely lose it. But then at the same time, I didn't want them to refused to get cyberware or spliceware because they were afraid they were going to become a monster. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to sort of like have that sort of arc and to be aware that they don't have to be so afraid of losing everything, but they can't become everything all at once. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in so, in some of the in some of the early play tests, did you have people who were a bit who were a bit hesitant to take on, um, to take on cyberware or spliceware because because they because they wanted to play it safe and not risk being a, not risk going full mutant. Yeah, actually, there were a lot of people. Everybody went with when when they were making their own characters. Everybody went with their what their safe bread and butter was. Like we had some people that would pick like different races that had or different variants we don't call them races we call them variants mm -hmm. but they would pick different variants that had a lot of ability um if you look up at that banner i sent you you notice the guy in the corner that's got like the coral growing on him mm -hmm. 
we had one of our playtesters, he, he gravitated to that because they're strong and they're powerful. Like, they're very tough, but the coral, like, makes them stiff and it slows them down. So it makes it hard to swim. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was, like, thinking that he was just going to dominate a fight, but then when they had to actually go across the water and, like, dock a boat, he was worried. He's like, I don't want to do this, guys. So I thought that was kind of funny that he uh, that he made those choices and that's how it affected him. Mm -hmm. Now, when it when it comes to when it came now when it came to the um, set the typical setup with ed edges skills and and whatnot. Um, obviously, when it comes to new edges, that's that's some that's something that's not that's not a, that's far from uncommon within the um, third party end of Savage Worlds. Everybody makes mm -hmm. new edges. Um, right. Were there any instances you can think of where you where you were considering or e or even went all the way on on making new skills? Not really, actually. Um, because Savage Worlds does a really good job of covering all the skills you need. Mm -hmm. I had tooled with the idea of skill specialization but then I decided against it because I I don't want to limit my characters too much. You know, I don't want I don't want to make it impossible. But I did think I do think that they have all of the skills that you already need are already there. Mm -hmm. I did create some edges, but the skills I believe were were just good as they were. Yeah. Now with that, with that said, you ha you're um, you're getting cl you're getting close you're getting close to close to the end. Um, now, presuming everything goes as planned, and j and just to make sure I don't jinx anything. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as the release window for the Drowned War, at least when it comes to its digital version? So I have I've taken a very conservative estimate in that I I posted to not expect it until November. Mm -hmm. But I've been writing and I've made a lot of headway and I've got a lot of art. I'm waiting on more art to come in. Art has been like the biggest thing for me budget-wise and time constraint-wise. Uh, for the most part, even though I said November, I really do think I can get it done a lot quicker. I just chose November because, I one, um, it gives me enough time to really hammer out everything and get it done early. It's better to shoot. It's better to get it done early than to get it done late. Because I really do not want to be late. <laughs> so I would say, you know, one estimate is November, but definitely before then, you know? Mm -hmm. Actually, this... Go ahead. You know, it wraps up August, September, October, November. Yeah, that's four months. The The digital version, I wanted to go ahead and get the digital version released like within an within one or two months and then have the proofs in my hand ready to go within the next two months. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, the, now with that, with that in my, with that in mind, um, when it comes, when it comes to, what would you, when it comes to the playtesting experiences that you've, Ha that you had with the drone war. What, what what would you say you have been some of the um, learning experiences with it? Ah, uh, I would say that it there is a little bit of a learning curve when you introduce something. Ah, uh, it, it was so funny to me when we did the play test that people could accept um, brain in a jar robots and walking coral colonies. But they really couldn't get over the idea that there was a place that they told you it was 1934 every year. They were like, no, people will know. People will figure it out. And I'm like, yeah, everybody knows. 
everybody knows it's not 1934. That's the point. You have to say it's 1934. They arrest you. It's how they they give you the litmus test to see if you're going to comply or not. So it's so funny that these fantastic science fiction elements are just so readily available. But the day-to-day living has been the hardest part for people to accept. You know what I mean? Like, just peer-to-peer interaction just seemed to be so off. But, no, that's that's really what it was, was trying to explain how the, the society and the system works in a lot of these cases. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can get that. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on, to come up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Mm. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to re- to return, the do- the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll extend an invitation to you. If you'd like to join our Discord group, uh, I'll post a link for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, next time we have a one-shot, you can join in. All right, I, I do appreciate that. But, of course, a sincere thanks goes out as well to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!